Friends, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name, make known God's deeds among the peoples, sing to the Lord, sing praises to God, tell of all God's wonderful works, glory in God's name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. So come, let us worship God. Let us pray. Saving One, we pray for your presence and your blessing on your church today, scattered and apart, yet united in the power of your love. God of mystery and might, whose wonderful works are to be remembered, move in our lives, change our minds, soften our hearts, direct our steps, that we may follow you more faithfully and more joyfully. Come, Holy Spirit, Enliven our lives, our worship, our praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace and joy of the Lord be with you and yours on this Lord's Day. Thank you for joining us for worship from our sanctuary here at Catonsville Presbyterian Church. The order of this morning's service, including the hymns, may be found on our website, catonsvillepress.org, and also on our Facebook page. Again, thank you for joining us for worship this morning. We have several announcements we want to lift up today. Dorothy Bolton, our associate pastor, is away on vacation, and we look forward to welcoming her back this week. The intercessor list will be going out on Wednesday evening, so please send your prayer, prayer requests to me. Uh, either on Monday or Tuesday, even Wednesday morning would be fine, but you can send them to me this week. Our non-perishable food drive continues on Friday afternoons uh, from between 4.30 and 6.30 uh, p.m. Uh, you may come and drop off your cans and your, um, and your food items uh, here at the church, the Frederick Road entrance right there in the, in the parking lot. Our face mask challenge is underway, sponsored by Lutheran World Relief, and you can sign up for it on our website. 
The Messenger, our newsletter, will be going out on Thursday or Friday. We had hoped it would go out last week, uh, but we are holding it for another week because session will be meeting on Wednesday night, and we will be making some decisions about worship and the use of the building uh, long term into October, November, and December. Uh, so we will include that in the Messenger and send it out on Thursday. Next week, we will still be worshiping at 9.30 a.m., but we move back to the 10.30 time the following week, the week after Labor Day, September 13th, which is our kickoff Sunday for the new church program year. So let us continue to worship God. So last Sunday, we looked at a text from Romans in which Paul describes the church and all the members of the church as being many and yet one in Christ. Many and yet one in Christ. And we talked about the ways in which in the life of the church, we are the church, we are gathered, we can be together even when we're not gathered together. This week, also in Romans, you will hear toward the end of this reading, in a few moments, Paul's command, really, a directive, a, uh, a wish, a hope, that we would extend hospitality to strangers. Now, when Paul says this, we learn something very important about the life of the church, the early church. In the early church, Christians were known for creating communities, churches, in which everyone was welcome to be part of that community. So the, their arms were spread very, very wide and welcomed everyone into the life of the church. And I think this is important for us to, to remember because Sometimes we prefer to be with people who are like us. Sometimes we prefer small groups. Sometimes we prefer to hang around with people who look like us, dress like us, think like us, pray like us play like us, but in reality, the life of the church, Christ calls us to extend our arms very, very wide. I love this sculpture, which I used last week, because it gives a sense of the church being together, sort of in a circle, many, yet one. And I love how their arms are all connected. And it reminds me that in the life of the church, we're always extending our arms out so that the circle becomes wider and wider. The circle becomes bigger and bigger and bigger so that we welcome all of God's children into the life of the church. So I invite us to think about this as we think about the church, as we think about people who might not feel welcome people who might feel excluded, people who might feel left out. And we can all do our part to try to open up the circle and welcome new people into, the, into our lives, into our friendships, into the life of the church. So let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for the church and for the ways in which your arms just open wide and welcome all of us, all of us, close to you and to one another. We are grateful, Lord, for your church. Even though we cannot be here in the sanctuary, we know that we are united and bound together through the power of your spirit. In Christ's name, we offer this with thanks. Amen. As we approach this morning's text, please join me in a prayer for illumination. Let us pray. 
By the power of your Spirit, O Lord, make your word become a joy to us and the delights of our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Let us listen now for God's word as it comes to us from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 9. Listen now for what the Spirit says to the church. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. These verses can sound like a long laundry list of all that is expected of us as Christians, a list of do's and don'ts. If you separate out or tease out all of the exhortations in Romans 12, verses 9 through 21, there are approximately 24 commands. And these commands cannot be separated from all that comes prior in chapter 12, beginning with 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul's description of the Christian life, or perhaps better, a life ordered by the life of Christ, runs right through chapter 12 and then pours into the next chapter and beyond. And Paul's point here is a simple one. The life in which Jesus is Lord will take on the characteristics, the virtues, the qualities, the life of the risen Lord. There are certain marks of a Christ follower, a particular way of relating to the world, a particular way of moving in and through the world, a, di a distinctive way of behaving and thinking and talking and acting. I appeal to you, therefore, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, and the therefore here signals a turn in the letter, this letter to the struggling church in Rome. In the first half of the epistle, Paul makes a case for the gospel. This is the good news. This is the gospel. The faithfulness of God has been revealed to us in Christ. In Christ, we see the saving power of God to redeem and to save and so, if this is true, as Paul claims that it is, and as the church in Rome was coming to see, then we can't live and act the way we did before when we did not know the work of God in Christ. Even now, we are being called to live informed by the transforming life of the risen Christ. 
And so Paul invites them to participate or share in this new reality and therefore warns the church with these words, do not be conformed to the present age, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and whole. With the renewing of our minds and our hearts, our lives slowly begin to change. And only then, according to Paul, can we begin to discern the will of God, all that is good and acceptable and whole. Which brings me back to the list of exhortations in our text, because we have to be very careful that we don't pull out these commands out of context and then turn them into a new list of virtues to live by general life principles that we can strive for to make our lives better. Christian ethics must always have a theological ground. In other words, our theology, that, what, that is how we understand the gospel, God's saving power to redeem and to save. Our theology shapes our ethics and never ever the other way around. Our ethics how we live our lives, the choices that we make, all of it is ordered by the life of Christ. And our ability to live a Christian ethic is directly related to the ongoing renewing of our minds through the work of the Holy Spirit who enables us to grow deeper or grow up into the knowledge of God and discern God's will and discover all that is good and acceptable and whole. It is impossible to live the Christian life on our own without help, for Christ's way does not come naturally to us. It's not in our nature to live this way. And yet, and here's the paradoxical aspect of the Christian life. And yet, neither are we completely passive to the Spirit's ministrations. We Protestants love to talk about grace, and rightly so. And we get nervous if anything smacks of works righteousness. That is, meaning that we are saved by good works and not by the power of grace. Anything that smacks of works righteousness gets us very, very nervous. It's true, we are not saved by works, but by grace. But this doesn't mean there isn't work for us to do. It's not an invitation to do nothing. It's not an invitation to sit back and be passive and just rely upon God's grace. In fact, grace has a way of enabling us to do the work that we couldn't or wouldn't even attempt to do previously. Grace frees us to work. Grace facilitates our capacity to do God's work. God grants agency, that is, the ability to be productive and creative and useful, living the lives that our souls long to live, lives, lives that reflect the good and serve the good. God frees us. Grace frees us to work with joy and gratitude then and not from anxiety. And then the work of our lives bears witness to the presence of the living Christ. Grace frees us to work. As I read and reread over these verses this week, these words sort of came to mind or they came up from within me. I found myself saying, do the work. That's what I heard Paul saying to the fledgling church in Rome and to us. Just do the work. Do the work. Do your work, the work that God is calling you to do, and you need to figure out what that work is. Do the work. Do your work. And it's not easy. When you dig down deep and listen to what Paul is saying here, and then imagine what it must have been like to be a member of a church trying to follow Jesus Christ, 
living in Rome, the capital of the largest empire of the world, the largest empire the world has ever seen, that wasn't easy. The church in Rome grew out of the small yet vibrant Jewish community that lived along the Tiber River. The Jews were a marginal group in Rome. Many were enslaved by Rome and forced to leave Jerusalem after the Roman legions destroyed the temple in 70 AD. The followers of Christ here, this Jewish community, and then the followers of Jesus within this community, the followers of Christ were a minority within a minority. Which is good to remind us, good to remember that the Gospels and the letters of the New Testament, indeed most of the Bible, is really minority literature. It's the writings of a marginalized group of people. These writings, the texts of Scripture, especially the New Testament, they were never ever the text of the majority. They only came to be so much later. And when we keep all of this in mind and that we begin to see that what Paul expected from this small group of Christ followers in Rome was astonishing, really astonishing. It was bold and radical and risky, countercultural. From the perspective of the Romans, it was ludicrous, unconventional, at odds with the powers that be, at odds with the prevailing ethic of the Roman Empire, which was built on brute force and domination. Keeping that in mind, Paul then writes to them, a church in the capital of the Roman Empire. Let love Agape, be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Genuine, agape here, means love that is authentic, real, without deceit or deception. Genuine here means what you say and do in public, correlates with what you say or do in private. In society, in a society built upon deception, the Christian loves genuinely. And love, agape, is going to be needed to withstand all that is evil in the empire. This isn't sentimental love or romantic love. It's a different kind of love. It's a force and it's fierce, and it's strong. In Graham Greene's wonderful novel, The Power and the Glory, the Mexican priest sitting in jail tries to describe God's love to his jailer, his jailer who doesn't have faith. It's often unrecognizable, the priest says. It might even look like hate. It would be enough to scare us, God's love. It set fire to a bush in the desert, didn't it? and smashed open graves and, and set the dead walking in the dark. I love that. It's powerful, this love, this agape. It's unsettling. It's disturbing. It's never, ever what we expect. Love is as strong as death. And it's the kind of love required to face the evil in the world. The Swiss theologian Karl Barth, in his magisterial commentary on Romans, which upended the theological world when it was first published in 1918, said this, Only the love which is strong enough to abhor that which is evil can cleave to that which is good. And we, as Christ's people, are called to cleave to the good, to strive after the good, not be good. No one is truly good but to strive after the good. The good that every human hungers for. A good that can be shared collectively, not just for some, not only for those with power or those in power or the rich, but for everyone. This too is at odds with the way the Romans organized their society. Indeed, in Roman society, which was a shame-honor culture, public shame was used to control and get people to conform. 
Paul knows, on the other hand, that agape, God's love, undercuts the inherent evil and shame honor systems, which was also true for Jesus. Agape, you see, dismantles this ethic and offers a still more excellent way. Paul calls them to outdo one another, even make a game out of it in honoring everyone, not shaming people, but honoring people. He called them to kind of compete in a, in a kind of fun kind of game to outdo one another in honoring one another, not only in the church, but out there beyond the walls of the church in society. Now we can go through the rest of this text and see how Paul's appeal to do the work is difficult and challenging. I'm only scratching the surface here. These verses serve as a wonderful summary of what we're called to be as followers of Christ, not only on a personal level, but also collectively as a congregation, and not only as a congregation, but how a Christian tries to live and serve and strive to be faithful in society in any age, including ours. For we are called to do the work. In fact, I would like us to focus on this text between now and the end of the year until Advent and allow this text to shape our life together, both individually and collectively, to allow this text to speak to us and to speak through us. Between now and the end of the liturgical year, we will revisit this text many times. And it's clear from this text, it's clear just by turning on the news that there's work to do. We, you, need to figure out what that work is. What's your work to do? And it's worth remembering that this text, the, this focus or conversation I'm inviting us to enter into here is an opportunity for us to be humble, to exercise humility, because we're all works in progress, aren't we? We're all under construction or reconstruction. This is a good reminder because there are plenty of folks around who think they already know how to be a follower of Christ and there's nothing more to learn. Don't believe them. During the Reformation, when Martin Luther challenged the censure of his teachings by Pope Leo X, he leaned into the idea that life is a process of becoming. This life is not righteousness, he said, but growth in righteousness. Is not health, but healing. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we shall be, but we are growing toward it, Luther said. The process is not yet finished, but it is going on. This is not the end, but it is the road. All does not yet gleam in glory, but all is being purified. Luther's contention that the Christian life is forever an unfinished product didn't sit well with the powers that be. He was excommunicated from the church within two months. This story reminds me of something the, the poet and novelist Maya Angelou once said about her faith. She said, I'm trying, I'm working at trying to be a Christian, and that's serious business. She said, it's not something where you think, oh, I've got it done. I did it all day, hot diggity. The truth is, she says, all day long you tried to do it, tried to be it, and in the evening, if you're honest and have a little courage, you look at yourself and say, hmm, I only blew it 80, 86 times today. Not bad. I'm trying to be a Christian, she confessed. And then she said, and I love this, I'm always amazed when people walk up to me and say, I'm a Christian. I always think, Already? You've already got it? My goodness. You're fast. 
already? There's work to do. May it be so. Amen. In response to the word proclaimed, let us give as God has so abundantly given us. With joyous and generous hearts, let us present our offerings to the Lord. Let us remember all that God has given and gives us and offer our thanks. There are ways you can give online through our website, and here I'm talking specifically to CPC members and friends. If you're not a member or friend of the CPC community, please consider giving to a faith community where you live, a neighborhood church that could use your support at this time. In a time of silence now, we invite you to take a moment to offer thanks for God's gifts to you this week. Time, talent, money, family, friends, and life itself. And ask yourself, where is the Spirit leading me this week to share my gifts through the work of the church 
and the love of neighbor. Let us pray. Loving God, when we stumble in our discipleship, you do not give up on us, but instead invite us to again to follow you. We recommit ourselves this day, giving these gifts as a symbol of our will to give ourselves entirely to you. Take them, we pray, to relive, to relieve the suffering of your people. May these offerings be a means through which others find reasons to rejoice, so that we may rejoice and praise you together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we gather now with the prayers of the people, we lift up the needs and concerns, the joys and concerns of this community and the world around us. This morning we pray for the people of Kenosha, Wisconsin, and the civil unrest there after the shooting of Jacob Blake. We pray for peace and for understanding. We pray for all those impacted by the forest fires in California, for those recovering from Hurricane Laura in Texas and Louisiana. We pray for healing in the deep divisions in American society at the moment. And here too, we pray for peace and for mutual understanding and respect. 57 years after the march on Washington, the struggle for racial equity continues. So let us continue that work, that work to overcome the evil and the sin of racism, intolerance, white supremacy, allowing ourselves, we pray, for the overcoming of evil with good. So let us pray 
for the strength to do the good in the work that God is calling us to do. Let us pray. Listening, God, you promise never to leave us or forsake us. You walk beside us, before us, behind us. Your presence is all around us. You have been faithful to our ancestors, and we know that you remain faithful to us. Receive the prayers and praises of your people. Receive our love and our gratitude. In confidence and faith, we turn to you and place before you our burdens, our hopes, our anxieties and fears for our lives, loved ones in the world. Hear us now, loving one, we beseech you, listen to the prayers of your people for peace where there is conflict. For food where there is hunger. for health where there is sickness, for faith where there is insecurity, for love where there is hate and fear, for understanding where there is distrust and confusion, for welcome and acceptance where there is exclusion and rejection. For life where there is death. For hope where there is despair. For peace where there is division. Hear our prayer, O Lord, for we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, your Son, who overcomes all that would try to defeat us and, and gives us new life and a future, your future. And so we pray, our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will, will be done, done on, on earth, earth as, as it is, is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us, us this, this day our, our daily bread, bread and forgive us our debts as, as we forgive, forgive our debtors. And lead, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the, and the power and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen.
now, friends, remember there is work for us to do. And may we be open to the movement of the Spirit who continues to renew our hearts and minds. And the blessings of Almighty God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit be with you and bless you today and always. God's peace be with you. Amen.